Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard. The Inside Analog Photo radio program is all about the traditional photographic process. We talk about all aspects of analog photography, including the hybrid workflow. You can find out more information over at www.insideanalogphoto.com. And of course, Inside Analog Photo is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. These guys have the coolest instant photography materials known to mankind. They have, of course, the pack film and three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five, color and black and white. They have the Instex systems in the wide format, the Instex 210 camera and film, and of course, the Instex Mini in the Instex Mini 7 and the Instex Mini 25, both in color film. Beautiful stuff. There's nothing cooler than instant photography. You get a print because if you don't have a print, you don't have a real photograph. This is great fun stuff. This is great for art. This is great for business. This is cool stuff. You definitely want to check them out over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends over at Photo Publicist, providing worldwide publicity, strategic promotion, social media marketing, and business development for the photographer, turning photographers into celebrities. You can find out more information over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the highest quality work known to mankind anywhere on this planet. Unbelievable developing, scanning, and of course, output on high quality Fuji Crystal Archive. Unbelievable cool stuff these guys are up to. And remember, you don't have a photograph unless you have a print in your hand and you need to print your pictures. This is important. You need to supply proofs to your customers and even print your own work because it's not about looking at it on a monitor. It's about holding a print in your hand. Definitely check these guys out at Richard Photo Lab, of course at richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5, DR5 Chrome, black and white, developing that turns your black and white neg into, that's right, black and white chrome. Unbelievable stuff, www.dr5.com. Our friends over at Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com for the camera strap that will not slip off your shoulder, guaranteed bar none, the coolest strap around. Our friends at Iger Studios for the finest quality drum scans known to mankind, Iger Studios. Dot com. Our official media partner, APUG, the analog photography user group for all things traditional photographic process on the web, www.apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, International Museum of Photography and Film, over at www.eastmanhouse.org. Today on Inside Analog Photo, we're going to be here with Lisa Berry. Lisa is a graduate of fine art photography from the Rhode Island School of Design. She's been documenting weddings since 2004. She shoots weddings, portrait, family lifestyle, great stuff, medium format shooter, contact 645, Hasselblad, a lot of great stuff going on. She's in Bloomington, Indiana. We're going to talk to Lisa about herself, her photography, her integration of design in her photography, and all this great stuff going on with Lisa Berry. Lisa, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. Great to have you on the program to talk about yourself, your beautiful photography, your use of film, and all this kind of cool stuff that's going on. Well, thanks for having me. No, it's great to have you on today. So, Lisa, give me your elevator pitch about what you do, and then we'll dig a little deeper. Well, I'm a wedding photographer. I've been shooting on film for about six years. I went to school for photography at an art school, and I learned kind of at that interesting time when things were just turning hybrid. And that's kind of how I approach weddings, the same way that I was trained, sort of from the fine art standpoint. Well, you went to what? The Rhode Island School of Design, correct? That's right. So did you have a interest in photography, I'm assuming, prior than going to school? Not a lot, actually. I thought that I'd be going to school for painting. And when I got there, I took a photo class. And the amazing difference was that it takes you out into the world and you get to respond to things instead of being in your studio, seeing what you can come up with from inside. So I took to it right away. Took a photo class freshman year, and that was pretty much it for me. Spent the next three years kind of immersed in contemporary photography and in a dark room. So really no photographic exercises or experience when you were a kid or in high school or nothing like that? Not too much. I remember my parents wouldn't even let me have the camera because that was for adults. It was kind of a fun thing to discover in college. See what they did? I know, they made me want it. So tell me what you did when you were in college with photography. I mean, you're taking traditional photography courses. I'm assuming they taught you traditional technique, dark room development. 
Right. Yeah, we started with the black and white darkroom, which is such a good foundation. You learn to look at light as your primary source that way. And I think the magic of the darkroom is what really snags you. It's kind of how a lot of people fell in love with photo. I would make myself the darkroom monitor so that I could stay as late as I wanted and kind of wait till other people left so I could have the darkroom to myself and then just stay there all night sometimes. And then I switched to color at a certain point and sort of decided to focus my fine art photography towards color. Getting into weddings has been cool because I get to incorporate black and white back into things. So tell me when you left school, you graduated from Rhode Island, what happened? Did you go and just jump feet first into wedding photography? How did you end up from Rhode Island back to Indiana? Or was it back or was it another diversion? Well, I stayed in Rhode Island for a while. I was newly married and I started just looking for summer jobs and sort of answering posts on the RISD job board and got a few weddings that way. It was supposed to be sort of an interim thing until I got some kind of real world job. And it turns out that weddings were sort of the best real world for me. I took to them immediately. Just as soon as I started shooting them, realized that it's pretty much the most fun I could imagine having in a job. What is the attraction for weddings? Is it because you're a girl? Is it because you want to tell a story? I mean, what is the attraction for wedding photography for you? Well, I'm not one of those girls who grew up dreaming about weddings or anything. You know, when you're doing street photography and this awkwardness of approaching people or wanting to have people in your images, but getting the glares or getting the people who don't quite trust why you would want to make an image. There's so much freedom at a wedding. Everyone expects you to be taking their picture. So that's great. I mean, really, what's better than being around people who are in love? Sometimes the next day after a wedding, I have like residual happiness from the day before, (laughs) just from being around them all day. Well, you're right. I mean, that environment, typically in a wedding, most people are pretty happy. And as they drink, they get even happier. It's true, and the dance party is so fun to photograph. And I think there's just so much thought into it. There's so much beauty built into weddings. I don't want to say that it's easy to photograph them, but it's never a point when there's nothing to photograph. There's so much going on. So with your business and what you're doing, do you shoot solo? Do you have a second, third shooters? What do you do? I bring a second shooter with me, and I try and pluck people from sort of a fine art context. People who didn't know they were interested in weddings, usually. And I pick them for their personalities and for their eye. And I've had great luck that way. Do you find that people seek you out because you shoot film? Quite often. A lot of the people that I end up shooting for are other photographers, graphic designers, people who their sister's a photographer, that kind of thing. I'd say maybe two-thirds of my clients know they want film, and the other third just sort of want me. In Indiana, it's different. I think that there are two, maybe three film photographers in Indiana. They're really oh. different from the West Coast. Only two or three. That's terrible. Yeah, it is. It's kind of isolating, but it's fun to kind of connect with other photographers around the country lately. And there are lots more out there. There's a few of us around. We just hide a lot. So tell me about the state of wedding photography where you're at. Are you guys busy? Are you seeing upturns, downturns? What have you seen here in the past few years about what's been going on? For me, it's been pretty steady. I do about half of my weddings here in the Midwest and half of them I fly around the country for. And I guess I've just been fortunate that the stream of referrals keeps coming. I've seen changes, though, in the industry as a whole. There's more competition, but ultimately I think that's a good thing. I think it will push people to be better photographers. I'm not sure everyone shares that sentiment, but I guess if you're confident. Yeah, I think if you're confident in your own deal, then you're fine. You're right. The industry is getting overpopulated, I think, to a point. And with right. digital photography, it's very easy for somebody that doesn't know what they're doing to make a decent looking picture. But to do that consistently over and over again at wedding after wedding. Well, I'd be another story. Another problem I see, too, is the consuming public mm-hmm. doesn't know what really good is or bad. Right. I guess I've been really fortunate that I have some pretty visually literate clients, but I know what you're talking about. I've heard about little studies that can be sort of sad where a prospective bride is shown sort of a masterful photograph and something really mediocre and she likes them both the same. Tell me about shooting this wedding that you shot that was very gothic. Oh, well, that was someone from RISD. In San Francisco, actually. Right. It was a very San Francisco wedding. It was on Halloween last year. And I've seen some Halloween weddings before that I didn't really like, but this one was a bit different. They sort of laughed at themselves while they were doing it and somehow managed to say really pretty. The bride really walked the line between being a vampire and being pretty. I'd say I've never shot a wedding like that before. It was pretty funny. They had a werewolf, the officiant, and the reading was Edgar Allan Poe. 
it was mostly just kind of a big Halloween party with the weddings meshed in there. Very different from what I'm used to. Now, how did you come upon these people? How would they pick you and then bring you in from Indiana? Friends of friends from school. It's wonderful the way that works. Once someone trusts you, then they'll sort of put your name out and recommend you highly. I think beautiful looking pictures and a very cool theme on top of it. So let's talk about how you're trying to tell the story. What style would you put your photography in? Would you be a photojournalist? How would you classify somebody and say, well, what kind of photography do you do, Lisa? I can never find the perfect three words to describe it exactly. I would say that I take a sort of holistic approach that I try and get the very complete sense of the wedding. So that means getting some things that are scene setting, getting the whole ambiance of the place, the details that they put a lot of time into, and then a lot of just very real interaction. I could say things that I'm not. I'm not a fashion photographer. I'm not a traditional photographer, and I'm not a pure photojournalist. But I am interested in sort of finding things that are really happening and then sort of framing them as beautifully as possible so that what they have for their memory of that day is something that they just want to keep looking at over and over again. Do you find that the story that you're trying to tell during the day, are you telling people what to do in posing or do you just let it sort of go? Yeah, I am. Um, I try and give them as little direction as possible. I think a lot about sort of what's the meaning of wedding photographs, what it's all for, what's this about. I don't know if you've ever been at a wedding where there are lots of sort of young digital shooters who are all sort of out to get some pictures. And so you have like six or seven people who are all around the couple and it stretched to feel like vultures or something. Like we're trying to consume the moment or like eat the couple with our camera or something. I <laughs> see that and I just think it's so gross and it's so not what it should be about. Because then the moment ceases to be an actual moment and the moment becomes the act of photographing. So part of my philosophy is to slow things down, to have them not always really aware that I'm there. And shooting film really helps that because you end up taking one or two frames instead of eight or ten. Just keeping the whole thing sort of more about the actual day and the actual interactions between people. Did you shoot film consistently straight out of college or did you do digital for a while? No, I haven't done digital. I'm a person who, when something is good, I don't necessarily want to change it. So when everyone around me was sort of changing to digital, I didn't really see any need to. I was using 35 millimeter because that's the kind of tools that you have around that age. And then at some point in there, I got a contact 645, and that really changed things. And now that's mostly what I shoot with. What did it change? Did it change the way you shoot, the way you frame, the way you compose, or just the output quality of what you were shooting? I would say both. I think that it's a little bit lower, so it's not quite as much focused on action and a little more considered. And I think a lot of the frames that I'm taking now are a bit further back from this subject, sort of getting their whole figure in quite a few. No, the context has been great. The output is pretty great. So you're shooting with a contact 645. What kind of glass? What do you like to shoot with? My favorite is the 80, and then I also have a 140 and a 45. How do you like the 140? The 140, I don't use it as much as I'd like to. When I do bring it out, I'm always happy that I did. Sometimes I end up framing things in a similar way that I would have with the 80, only I back quite a few yards. But it has a way of separating the lanes a little bit differently. Yeah, more compressed image. Yeah. So I'm all about having some variety in the shots. So really with the 140, it's more of the same style of framing, just more compression between foreground and background. Right. And also, I love it during the ceremony. Then I can pull out the 140 get closer to them. Do you find the 2H fast enough? Yeah, it's pretty good. A lot of times I'll end up shooting a couple of rolls of 3200 speed in ceremony if we're inside in a church or something. So that tends to be a good combination. And I'm all about the tripod. It's cumbersome. You trip over it. It's annoying, but it's so worth it. So you shoot most things on the tripod then? Well, when you're inside, going for that gorgeous interior light, bring a tripod and hold things down to a fifteenth of a second. Everything's natural light? I mostly work with natural light. I do feel flash sometimes, and during the dance party, I'll often put some lights on the floor. But natural, I mean, it keeps the whole philosophy of having the wedding look as beautiful as possible, but also real. I tend to go for the natural light. Do you find that with shooting film that you can do things and be able to capture moments differently than somebody that's shooting digital? I think so. You don't often get the chance to compare the direct results from the same scenarios. 
but I definitely feel like there's sort of a measured and careful quality to film that ends up manifesting itself in the images. I guess because you're not machine gunning. Right. You think about it sort of in real time as that's happening. I definitely think that shooting the film, people are more direct in what they're going to shoot, and they're not just more randomly shooting because they can. And in return, you get better quality because you really have to train your eye to recognize that moment. Right. Yeah, it takes the sort of decisiveness, I think. How much time do you spend on details? Do you go to an area the day before, or do you pre-run what you're going to do? How much of the detail stuff do you like to shoot? That's a good question. I know it's easy to get wrapped up in the details if you're a person who likes them, which I am. And sometimes your clients don't want them. So I give them a questionnaire before the wedding to find out what's important to them and what's not. Most people who hire me do like the details, too. So it really varies from wedding to wedding. I just had a wedding out on the Cape, and I was there an entire day early before even connecting with the couple. And that was such a great luxury. I was able to photograph the Cape-specific things and a lot of details there. On the wedding day, before I even meet up with the couple, I like to go see if things are set up for the reception or hunt around and just see what I can find in the beginning in that sort of relaxed stage before things start. But then I'll try and sneak them in whenever possible without really missing things. And that's another place where it's great to have that second shooter. If it's cocktail hour, if we're done with taking formals, I'll run over and get some detail shots and she can do some candid. I think the detail things are so important on a destination type wedding. So like you said, you were at the Cape. And to be able to get to spend a day and get some establishing shots of just the destination itself that somebody might want to actually include in an album. When you're trying to tell a story, yes, you can shoot the ceremony and you can shoot the reception. At that point, unless you're in some crazy place, everything's the same. You could be anywhere. So to be able to grab these establishing details and these shots, I think is important with the storytelling process. And it's amazing how much that can sort of activate a picture. Say you put a bride and a groom next to something that is like an empty shot of the field or a really beautiful image of the place where they got married. I don't know, something happens when you combine the two. It's like these people now have a place to live. Definitely so. I'm sure you probably picked up some of this stuff as well when you were going to Rhode Island Design there. But I think if you look at the current state of publications for weddings, if you want to get your work published, you better have a lot of detail stuff. Yeah, that's true. I'd say it's a trend in the industry. It's probably one of the better trends we've had in a while, if you think about some of the horrible trends we've had in the past 10 years or so. Having a lot of beautiful establishing shots is probably a good thing. It's also possible, as always, to veer too far in that direction, to become obsessed with the details and lose sight of the people. So it's all about balance, I think. I don't know if it's good or bad, but I've noticed the trend lately that a lot of people are using props. Oh, yeah, I'm not so into that. Bring an old camera with them or dead tree branch or I don't even know what. I could see the props with the Halloween wedding, the coffin and some other stuff. That's cool. Right. Actually, his groomsmen brought him in in the coffin. I think it's one way of people exercising their creativity, but it does lose sight of the actual people and their own personalities. Maybe unless they bring the props. I guess that's a pretty good way to kill a look quickly is to modify it in that way. Do you find that, being a girl, that female photographers are better at shooting weddings than guys? Oh, that's a tricky question. I think that there are different types of good in wedding photography. There are almost like different branches of wedding photography that are all sort of valid. A lot of times when I see a single image and it's technically astounding and it's got this almost athletic kind of achievement to it, A lot of times that will end up being by a male photographer, and I can just sort of appreciate that for, like, catching the perfect action moment kind of thing. And a lot of times when I see a collection of consistently graceful, light, and lyrical images, where maybe each individual photograph isn't quite like a stunner, but overall they just have this really soft, beautiful feel to them, then often that's by a woman. You can't put into the pigeonholes like that, but there seems to be something to that. Maybe women have a softer sensibility or an intuition into what might make someone feel beautiful. But plenty of men have that as well. Yeah, I'm just wondering if the guys learn this from experience or if it's something that you just have. I mean, learn how to shoot and what moments to grab that convey that emotion. I think it's maybe more intuitive with a female. Maybe. I think it takes a special kind of a guy to be a wedding photographer, at least now. Someone who is maybe a little bit more in tune with things like that and not just completely techie. Right, exactly. What do you find that is the key image of a wedding? 
So let's use you as an example. You've been married now for what? Four years, five, six years? Seven years now. Seven years. Okay, so seven years after the fact. What wedding images of your wedding do you have display in your home? Mm, well, that's an interesting question. I have an image of my husband and I kind of like running, almost skipping. We were so young that we kind of couldn't contain our excitement, and we were just sort of actually skipping and holding hands. So we have that in a little frame. I think that's it. We only have the one. It's so funny. Photographers don't often have their own albums and things. Well, exactly. I mean, a shoe guy, his kids have holes in their shoes, and a mechanic's car is always leaking. But the point I get at is, do people get excessive with the whole wedding thing and having too many images or too many details, and they get into this whole thing, and down the road a few years, it's all gone. Did it really matter to start with? That's a very good question. It's something that I think about a lot, actually. Part of the way that I do things for people is I try and take the elements that could be overwhelming to wedding photography, like too many shooters or too many pictures being made, and sort of quiet it down. So with my presentation as well, I shoot maybe 600 images. I shoot about 20 to 30 rolls of film. And then I edit very carefully. So I have a huge table and I spread all the images out. My husband always laughs and says it looks like I'm dealing cards or something. I look through them very carefully. And if there are three images that sort of all say the same thing, I'll edit two of them out. So that what I give people is a box that contains about 400 prints. But hopefully they'll continue to just flip through. And just keeping it sort of small and not too overwhelming. Because I think about that, I want it to be meaningful and I want them to appreciate it. But it is just one day out of their life. Well, exactly. I mean, what if you turned over like 4,000 images? Why don't you look (laughs) through these and we'll work on your album in a decade? Yeah, it not only cheapens the photographs, but possibly cheapens the day to have it recorded in that way. I think photographers are editors in the best sense. While you're shooting, you're editing the day. And they pick you for your editing skills, your vision. And then later on, it's important to edit and only show them the ones that reflect the wedding back to them in the way that you think they'd want to see it. I think anything more than 400 images would seem like a lot to me. Everyone has different thoughts on that, but I think that they become more valuable when they're fewer and better. You look at these weddings you do, and you've shot some nice intimate ones, and then I'm sure you've done some that are just over the top, completely whacked crazy with the amount of money people spend. So I guess the point is, do you think that people are doing this level of detail and showmanship because of the guests that are there? And would they do the same thing if it was just four people? That's a really good question. It's one that maybe should be circulated on bridal forums. Well, I think so. I mean, you have this beautiful photography and you're documenting all this stuff, but let's say you had a huge wedding. There was 300 people there and you spent 100 grand and you had all these details and it looked like Martha did it for you, okay? And then seven years down the road, you got a picture of you and your boyfriend skipping. Cool. And that's it. So the point was, if you had gone through all of that level of detail and planning for your wedding and had an excellent photographer like yourself shoot it and did all this documentation, was it just a big game as a show for everybody that was there to say, I'm cool? Hmm. I hope not. I think it's something that I feel torn about sometimes, even just being part of an industry or being a business person or just trying to see the ways that people can be convinced to spend their money. I suppose $100,000 for a wedding when you have unlimited funds, then it's not that big of a deal. But if someone is sort of sacrificing a great deal for all these things and it's just to impress someone, then it's sort of... Again, I think it's all about balance. And a lot of my couples are really creative, too, so the process of making the details is fun for them and does hold some meaning. A lot of my couples, the mothers, then a florist. I've had that happen three times lately that the mother's able to give flowers as her contribution, like the mother of the groom or something. And then everyone in the room is able to appreciate her great work. I don't know. I think that there is a lot of potential meaning in the details. I don't want to see people try and sort of outdo each other or include things in their weddings just to sort of impress people. It's just quite interesting, and I think the way that you're telling the story, it's different. It's very cool. Oh, thank you. So let's talk about film. What kind of film do you like to shoot? I mostly shoot Kodak Portra 400 NC. That's kind of like my mainstay. I know that film very intimately, and it's just so gorgeous with skin tones. Then I also shoot 800 speed in the same line, and I shoot at least a few rolls over 3200. So you're a Kodak girl. I am. I guess that's what I started with in school, and once I find something that works for me, I just sort of stick with it. I'm very loyal. And I use Tri-X 400. That's about it. 
But I keep those in my bag, and my assistant ends up shooting the house of blood, and we sort of tag team. It's good to have that second shooter, too, because if I'm shooting colors, she can be shooting black and white, and then we can switch. So let's chat about the Vlad versus the contacts. So we have a rectangular 645 <laughs> format, and we have a square picture. Is this a Vlad where you look for a waist level finder? It has a prism finder on it. She laughs because I always steal it from her because I end up wanting that square. The House of Blood's sort of like my first love, so sometimes I just need it. When I first started shooting, I was shooting 35mm and Half of Blood. And it's very beloved, but it's also very slow in terms of focusing. It actually takes physical time to get that focusing dial to, to the right spot. By that point, sometimes your subject has moved. So for a wedding, it's a challenge. And the contacts, it's just like butter. When I first got it, I wanted to strap it onto my eye like a pirate's patch and just see the world through the contacts. It's just so beautiful. Manual um, focus with the contacts or autofocus? Part of the reason I got it was because it had that autofocus and I never use it. It's just easy enough to manual focus. And then you can be more decisive. No 35 at all anymore? Not really. Sometimes I'll bring it. Polaroid, Instax, Fuji, any instant photography? No, not so much. I mean, sometimes people will have their guest book as a Polaroid and then I'll pick it up and shoot. But I don't really bring one. I found you got to keep a balance with the gear, too. You end up bringing too much gear and having too many options. You can go a little nuts. Exposure. You shoot it at box speed. How do you like to shoot your Kodak? Well, my color teacher for photography was Henry Hornstein, who kind of wrote some of the books about photography. And he sort of taught me that you always overexpose color film. So whether or not that's true, that's what I do, and it works pretty well. I'll rate 400 speed at 320. So two-thirds of a stop, half a stop. Yeah, just enough. And I'll always err on the side of overexposing, unless I'm trying to get away with something. Which happens quite often, actually, because I'm finding a lot of the richest photographs lately to be that interior light. When it's still light out and you still have the light streaming in through the windows, but the light still has a beautiful quality to it, I like seeing what I can get away with there. Often those are the photographs that come back and sort of make you gasp when you see them. Let's chat about labs. Who do you use? How are you using your hybrid workflow? Let's chat about how that all sort of goes down. Sure. I've tried several different labs. I'm very picky. I had to come to terms with the fact that color deck room precision being that you get to do in art school was not going to work for weddings. But I actually found a really great lab, Philadelphia Photographics. They print everything really beautifully. Give me full frame prints for 645. I pretty much wanted to give them a hug through the phone when I found out they would give me full frame. And they also give me really nice clean scans, which seems important now. Even for people who want film, everybody wants to be able to share their photos in some digital format. Sure, of course. I mean, with Facebook and people's personal blogs and even digital mm-hmm. picture frames, you need to have the stuff available in a digital environment. Right. I have these gorgeous prints made, and they come back, and they have white borders. And then I have the woodworker make me boxes. I've been really happy with the lab, really great customer service, and they're not a huge operation. So when I call, they know who I am. I've had little things to tweak in the printing, and they've been really great. Do you typically find that your clients want to have albums done, or are they happy to start with with just having a nice set of prints, and then they have a digital copy as well? That's the quandary of prints, is that about half of my clients want albums. And I think if I didn't give them prints, more of them would. But I just can't imagine not having the prints. Well, as you well know, and you're educated in this, you don't have a photograph until you have a print. You don't have a picture. You don't have a photograph. And you look at them so differently when you hold them in your hand, and you end up appreciating images that you wouldn't have otherwise, I think. It's very different when you have something tangible in your hand and tactile, and it's real. Wedding photography has a lot to do with emotion, and a print has not like a false emotion where you set up a slideshow and really sappy music and force people to feel a certain way. It's more like when you look at photographs of yourself as a child or of your grandmother holding you or something and you have this print, there's something to it that I think is really well suited to a wedding. Let's chat about your other works. You're shooting other things besides weddings. Yeah, I try and maintain some of the fine arts. It's funny when you shoot so many hundreds of images on the weekend, you don't really want to pick up your camera on Monday. Maybe by Tuesday or Wednesday, you can pick it up. But the way that I shoot is very responsive. When the weather changes just slightly and things that were every day turn slightly odd, then I like to go out and just go hunting. I've got a show coming up in Portland, Oregon next May. I'm excited. Wow. How cool Um, is that? 
yeah, that'll be really fun. It's good to have a deadline and something to work for. Now, looking at your fine artwork, I find that it seems you like to document Americana. I'd say that's true, with a bit of a nostalgic twinge, but not too much, hopefully. I find, too, what I see in your fine art stuff, I can just smell Midwest. Yeah, I was born and raised in Indiana, so I've got that sort of corn-fed Hoosier, can't make it go away. The one I saw was like the Dairy Queen. I mean, where are you going to find one of those anywhere? And if you find one out here, it's some prefabricated drive through gig. Right. I was in line in Rhode Island at the Dunkin' Donuts. It was like a line that went out the door and wrapped around the building. And I was like, this would only happen in Rhode Island. And this would not happen in the Midwest. And the person next to me said, oh, it would happen at Dairy Queen in the Midwest. Oh, you're right. I think photographers are always interested in the things that they might be going away. We try and hold on to them with pictures. So things that have to do with sort of the slowness of the summertime, things like Joel Meyerowitz, Cape Light, people hanging around. It's always so hard to talk about your fine art, but those are the things that interest me. And also sort of people as figures, people as compositional elements that take a space and activate it. Do you always leave the building with a camera? No, I try and have part of my life where it's not there. When I first was married, I always had it with me, and my husband felt like we had an extra family member. I think you can take your photo eyes on and off, and sometimes I like to just be somewhere and take it in and not even have the option to record it so that I have to really be there. And then sometimes it works well to have the camera without consuming what you're seeing still to go out and shoot. Does that make sense? No, it does, exactly. I think it's very cool. I just always remember Jay Maisel. He's never without a camera. Right. There have been plenty of times when I wished I had one. If only I had my camera. Yeah, well, I think now, though, that people have camera phones, and you always have your phone with you, even though it's digital. (laughs) What I want is I want a hybrid phone, a cell phone that's a 35 millimeter. Ooh, that would be nice. Good luck. Yeah, that's going to be a tough one, but who knows? Maybe one of our friends in Asia will make one. Yeah, my husband just got the new iPhone. He's a painter, so I don't paint anymore because he does all the painting. And I'm the photographer, so he doesn't really make images. But since he's gotten his iPhone, he's started to take pictures, and that's been kind of cool. There's definitely some cool apps for the (laughs) iPhone. I have a friend of mine that's got a gallery, and he just did another show of his own work, and it was all shot on the iPhone 3GS. And it's got this low-res organic feel to it. It's like almost expressionist looking art stuff, and they're just like, oh my, what is this? And you even tell them that, oh, this came from an iPhone. So I guess it really doesn't matter what the tool is. I mean, digital technology is great, and digital cameras are cool, but there's just something about film. I mean, it's organic, the way that photons hit silver, it's just different. It's magic. I mean, I could see doing these photo shoots, or if you're a photojournalist and you got to nail stuff in the paper. Unless you're going to suit black and white in the backseat of your car and scan it right on the spot that I still know guys that do that. But nevertheless, I mean, digital, it's a great application for certain things. But what I want to have my wedding shot on digital, but people do. So nevertheless, I think film is very cool. What are you looking forward to, Lisa, that you haven't got to do yet photography wise? Is there somewhere you want to go, some genre you want to shoot? What do you want to do that you haven't got to achieve yet? Well, I really want to have some kind of very complete, concise project in my fine art. I've had sort of like a meandering, just sort of way of seeing the world has been my project for the past decade, and I can never seem to shape it up into something very concrete. So I'm challenging myself to sort of embark on a few projects. That'll be exciting. In a way, I mean, every wedding is kind of like a project, and it has a start and an end, and that's so satisfying that you can forget to challenge yourself to have more projects. So I'm looking forward to that. I guess the other part of my life is that I'm a curator for a contemporary photo gallery. So I'm really looking forward to a lot of the shows that we have set for 2011. Interestingly, I see a lot of work that kind of comes across my desk, and I try and put my biases aside in terms of the way things were made and just assess the work on its own merits. But a lot of the things that rise to the top end up being things that were made with film. I think in the fine art context, film is still seen as a major player. I think so. I mean, if you look at a lot of galleries and if you speak to people that are curators and gallery owners, everybody's sort of always standoffish until you tell them they shoot film and then they always perk up and they want to see your stuff. With the gallery that you're working on, do you find that images sell better that are film-based? I think it has to do with just the overall image quality. Sometimes people will shoot on film and then make a print in a way that is less than ideal. I think when someone sees an image that has been taken care of from start to finish very carefully, 
and the vinyl print is stunning, then it sells well. And that's possible with digital as well. But I'd say, yeah, most of the sales have been film. Very interesting. So, Lisa, tell me, where do we look at your wedding photography, your blog, your fine artwork? You have a few places across the web where things are hanging out, and there's a great article on weddingphotodirectory.com as well. That was a nice article. And there's a link to that off of your site, I think, or somewhere there was. Yes, um, my site's lisaberryphotography.com. Barry with an E. And then the blog is lisaberryphotography.blogspot.com. I do really appreciate you joining today to get to chat about yourself and your photography. And it's great to see that you're using film. And it's just cool to see this enthusiasm that you have and this passion. It definitely comes across. It's such a rich, beautiful medium. I hope that it stays alive. I think it will. Oh, it will. And your work's great. Lisa, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It was great to talk to you. Well, there you go. Lisa Berry. What a great gal. Beautiful photography, a keen eye, design inspiration. A lot of great stuff going on, Lisa. You definitely want to check her website over at www.lisaberryphotography.com. The Inside Analog Photo Radio Program has been brought to you by Fujifilm for their full line of instant cameras and film. And, of course, fine quality Fuji Crystal Archive paper over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. Our friends at Photo Publicist, Worldwide Publicity, Strategic Promotion, Social Media Marketing, and Business Development over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the finest quality lab in the country, richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5 for black and white chrome at dr5.com. Upstrap for the finest quality camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder at upstrap-pro.com. Our friends over at Iger Studios at igerstudios.com. And, of course, our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group at apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, over at eastmanhouse.org. I've been your host, Scott Shippard, here on Inside Analog Photo. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography. 